an essential part of processing day, especially a fall processing day, is some candy corn. Pop these in, keep your energy flowing. Who wants one? Me, me. Or if you should put your, <laughs> you should put straight your up, mic. Straight it should go on this side. He always does this. <laughs> I learned in California, Juan, Juan always fixed me up I'm every day. I'm going to bite him like we did when we were little kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's I'll let you. I'll let you handle the backside. That makes it easier for me. <laughs> there you go. For this one time. Candy corn time. All right, it's time to process. Today we're in the farm shop, and this is all about what it's all about. And that's this kid over here, Logan. Raise your hand. Shot this buck along with his wonderful dad, and. We're gonna process it today. So we've been focusing a lot on um, meat that we were taking out of the freezer, like with the hot dogs, like with the summer sausage. These were more or less further processed. But today we're gonna to focus on just a, just a good old fashioned cutout. Um, you know, call it like a you know, family cut, economy cut, poor man's cut, whatever you will. Um, but we're going to cut out this deer, white-tailed deer, harvested right here in Wayne County, Ohio. And we're gonna use the meat grinder. Today we're gonna to be using the half horse, um, the number eight, and the meat 15 pound stuffer. Last time I called it a grinder or something like that. So that's why I said it like that. The stuffer, and um, we'll throw in the chamber vac too. But the idea is that we wanna show you just how budget friendly this can be or, or that entry point into this can be um, at a low budget point because with just the use of the grinder, um, obviously we can produce burger, but then the stuffer, we're gonna do some brats. And then for the vacuum sealing, you could do uh, the chamber vac or you could get the tabletop option to help preserve your meat. So that's the purpose of today's video. We're gonna be taking this buck and we're gonna be showing you, and we have the family involved um, in fact, where we're standing is the original slaughter floor on this farm. Built in the 1950s, this block building was where the animals were originally slaughtered before the new portion of our, uh, our meat plant where it stands today was built. So um, it's a great area. We know a lot of you folks will be doing this stuff in a garage, in a farm. Beautiful, gorgeous fall day. Temperatures are just right for this got the kids involved because these guys are fantastic at deboning meat. They, they help us out in the meat shop all the time. And so that's going to be a big help today, but it's just about having fun, getting everybody involved. We've got a smoker fired up. We're going to throw some seasoning on some of this as we're cutting it up, chop away. Let's talk a little bit about this shot. Logan has been practicing all summer long. This is why it's important to practice right behind the shoulder. We actually got the shot on film. But anyways, this deer went 40 yards. We didn't even have to follow a blood trail or look for a blood trail. We simply saw the deer's white belly laying um, in the woods. So great shot, Logan. This is why you practice. Also, always tag your carcass. ODNR will appreciate this. Upon retrieving the animal, fill out your tag and then make sure you check it in. So first thing we're gonna do to get started is remove the tag. This deer's been hanging for what? A little over a week, Seth? Nine days. Nine days. We dry aged in our cooler. Now, obviously we have the luxury. We have a 35 degree cooler that you see on the films all the time. Um, it certainly is a huge blessing. We've talked a little bit about this step, how important we feel it is. We have guys that talk about doing it with a hide on versus the hide off. We always do it with the hide off. We always do it for a period of, um, you know, bare minimum will be three days, but on a buck like this, seven to nine days is gonna be pretty much optimal. And then, you know, as far as options, if you don't obviously have a walk-in cooler, there are some, um, some various things that we've heard about, we haven't experienced them themselves. One would be um, CoolBot, which takes a window air conditioning unit and converts it somehow digitally. Um, you might check that out. Um, I think it's storeatcold.com not at any way um, 
endorsed or, or sponsored by those uh, folks, but we've heard about it. And we understand that this step being so important to us, we wanna maybe help you find some options to do it. Or like today, I mean, it's gonna be uh, about 60 today, but obviously we're in the coolness of the shop. It's been 35, 36 at night. So you certainly can use temperature, um, you know, your outdoor temperature at the right time of the year. This deer could have hung in this shop and been just fine the last few days. It's been that cool. Yep. One question people might ask is what does this carcass weigh? Logan was anxious to get it across a scale the day we skinned it, 129 pounds. So that's what it weighed going into the cooler and we'll see how much meat we end up with. So without further ado, let's just get started. Now, Logan shot this deer with a crossbow rage broadhead and it did make an entry on the opposite side and it did not make an exit. So um, during this butchering process, we are gonna need to keep an eye out for a broadhead. I never found it. It could have pulled out um, somewhere where the, from the point of impact to where we found it, but we don't know. So we are going to keep in mind that we did not find that, so it's something to keep an eye out for. Um, but let's just go ahead and get started. First thing we do is expose these flanks here a little bit to those gorgeous inner loins. We like to call them fish tenders, slang for deer tenderloin in this neck of the woods. You just reach inside here, make a cut on each side. Once you get the first initial couple cuts made, you can almost just pull this out. Look at that gorgeous tenderloin. Scott, what do you think the word today should be? We've had words over the years in our videos, one of them being an inc incredible eating experience. Incredible eating experience. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, um, what do you think about gorgeous? <laughs> gorgeous is good or beautiful or tender, incredible. Phenomenal. People talk about making a drinking game out of our, our little catch words or catch phrases. So there's the two tenders. Now what you want to do is you want to flip that carcass over. I like to start right here, top of this flank. This is where your tri-tips located. So we might save those tri-tips and throw them on the uh, Traeger for lunch today. Might, he says. We are. <laughs> right here, there's a hip bone. So you want to find that hip bone, take your knife, just cut down through like this. Then I'm gonna go ahead and grab our hand saw. And I'm gonna cut right through that vertebrae where that sirloin meets the, the loin right there. So that's the first step. Now we're going to just start breaking down these hind quarters. As soon as I get some scraps, I'll uh, have Scott set them over on the table so that the boys can start doing some deboning. You notice a lot of times Seth will make a, a cut or two and then he'll actually apply pressure just to start spread that apart. Find that ball joint there in the pelvis. And then as he we talk about angles all the time. Spin stuff around so you can find those angles so you can keep the heel of that knife down and that tip up so you can stay right along that pelvis so he doesn't get into his sirloin. It's apparent just with one, you know, look at this muscle that this deer is going to be perfectly aged and tender and incredible tasting. So 
So this is the chunk, the pelvis bone right here. I'm just going to throw it over here and the kids can start working it, trimming that off. One of them can anyway. There we have the two hindquarters. We're going to start seaming these out. Removing the shank. Cuts like this, we typically, we just, um, people talk about soup, soup stock and things like that. Yeah, you can certainly do that, but we're just going to take the meat from the bone and grind the meat in a hamburger, give the bone to the dog or make some stock. So with this round portion, what we're going to do is we're just going to seam it out and we're going to save some roast and we're going to cut some jerky. Removing that femur bone. Start with pulling the sirloin, a little chunk of sirloin. So growing up, our mom was telling us how that when we were kids, our dad would shoot a deer and he would take it to the butcher and he would often just kind of get like a standard cut and he wasn't able to really, um, I guess, change the cutting style a whole lot. So he got a lot of steaks and got a lot of roasts. And as kids, we didn't really eat the steaks. So she would find herself taking and getting the, um, you know, her household mixer, uh, I think it attached to like her kitchen aid. And she would be in the kitchen trying to grind this stuff up into hamburger. So we've been, you know, we're mindful of that. We certainly grew up tasting deer that was, you know, maybe not processed very well. So we learned to change our cutting style a little bit. Now with what we cut for our families based off of that. So we have something that doesn't need to be reworked at the end of the day. There he is. Yeah. Catch the old man. Howdy. Looking good, dad. I like it. Deer tri-tip. Wonder how many people save those. Not enough. Probably. That's gonna be lunch. I don't know what you're gonna eat, but I'm gonna set that aside and throw some seasoning, put it on the smoker here in a minute. This is the venison top round. Now we'll pull out the eye. These are all held together just by seams. Maybe you've seen this in some of our other videos. I want to talk a minute um, about a gland located inside this hindquarter. Right here's that gland we always talk about. Make sure we get that removed. That's going to go in the inedible barrel. Eye around. It's the bottom round. These will get trimmed out for um, roasts and jerky. It's nice to have a partner. A lot of times I'm the one doing all the, the deboning, but it's nice to have a partner as you're working through this, whether it's, you know, hunting buddy, spouse, whatever you have just to, and Seth and I have been working long enough together that we can kind of work without really talking much with each other, but it's nice to have somebody that can work through your trim pieces for you as you're going along. That way the stuff doesn't, pile up on you. We do right recycle or 100% or use everything that comes off of anything that we process here, whether it's deer or the commercial products in our store. So everything gets 100% recycled, repurposed, reused, bone broth, pet food, you name it nothing goes to waste when speaking we harvest of, an animal speaking of pet food i know i saw a little piece hit the floor over here and i'm here, wondering he must have missed a nice it. little piece right here for charlie there you go oh gotta remember those furry friends bottom round top round this is the eye of round you guys can chop up some stew meat if you get some nice lean pieces too okay We've got Victorinox boning knives and the combo cut steel. You can find these on our website. So we have one round seamed and ready to go.
Now we'll start on round number two. Pull that sirloin. You want to denude the tenders? Yeah, I wondered if you wanted me to do that. By denude, he just means that I'm going to take the uh, silver. I didn't, I didn't mean take your clothes off. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. It's a little bit cold for that today. <laughs> um, we can just take and trim the little bit of silver skin and connective tissues off of these. Here's that tri-tip. So we're gonna pull another one of these for lunch. Not a lot there, but guaranteed to be fantastic. So through this process, we do wanna to explain to you how to get the most, you know, Economic, uh, economically cut venison. So to feed a large family or even a small family, but for our, the longest period of time. So just keep in mind, that's kind of the approach we're going with. Deer this size, you know, it could potentially feed a family of four to six for, you know, several months easily, if not longer, depending on how far you stretch it out. We grew up eating a lot of hamburger helper. And so whenever you add noodles or anything like that to a product, it's always gonna stretch it out a little bit further. You have a lot of hungry mouths to feed. This is where we're gonna do our, our filet, like a, a fish method. So just, Get your fingers on, start your knife flat. Well, that didn't go as planned. Maybe I'll try this side. There we go. And just peel that outside off like that. There's another bottom round. <clears throat> We've got some pork fat today. We talk about this, typically we we remove a lot of the fat from the venison. Um, it will hold the gamey flavor, um, should there be any gamey flavor in the fat. This is obviously a pre-rut deer, but it is a buck. So it's something to bear in mind. Seth talked about the glands. You wanna make sure that you keep the glands out of there, but also large chunks of fat, something like this. Right in the center of that fat is a gland. So by taking the fat, you'll also get all the glands too, whether you're trying or not. So there's a couple different ways you can break this deer down. You can see that we made pretty short work of the hind quarter. Um, we could also have done it a little bit different and pieced out each sort of primal as we went. So we could have done, broke the hind quarters off, set those aside. Uh, pulled the shoulders off, set those aside, pulled the, the loins out of the back, set those aside and done it that way. But today um, we're going to just basically pull each section off of this deer and then break down each section as we go. So just to clarify that for you. And then we'll try to get everything laid out real nice here on the table so you can see what we've ended up with. It's time to pull these shoulders off. And with these shoulders, you can start just by making a cut right here and finding that seam. As soon as you find that seam right there, this, this shoulder blade kind of, kind of flows this way. So you can just pull and cut at the same time, keeping in mind that we're gonna keep an eye out for that broad head on the opposite side. So we'll just work our way down. There's one shoulder. We'll flip it over. Same thing on this side. Just 
So you can see the damage that that broadhead did going through that deer. And I can see the end of the arrow right here. So that's definitely where our broadhead's gonna be. And I was real care careful when I was field dressing this deer because I wanted to make sure that I didn't get um, cut by it. See that boys? Yep, yep. So when, when you don't, don't find or don't see that come through the opposite side, you wanna be real careful that you don't uh, get cut by it. So we're just gonna have to work our way around that and we'll get that pulled out of there. So let's see if we can get this broadhead out of here. And um, so since we're going with um, pretty much you know, an economical style cut, these are going to be just trimmed out for ground meat. So we're not gonna be damaging any cuts or anything like that in this process, since it's all gonna be trimmed out, boned out anyway. So let's find that first joint right there. And that broadhead looks to me like it went right into that bone. lodged right in that bone. So you can see it's the power of a rage. It's stuck right in there. Hey, can you give me a pair of pliers? I wanna see if I can pull this out. Unless you wanna, Logan, do you wanna save this and we'll boil it down with that broadhead in there? You wanna try to pull it out? I can't screw it, I'm sure. Might have to just wiggle it up and down. Yeah, that one's, let's just leave it. All right, I think what we'll do is we will, uh, maybe we'll boil this down, Logan. And then you can, you can save it with that rage stuck right in there. What do you think? Okay. For all your surgical or dentistry needs, please yeah. call <laughs> Scott Perkins at the Bearded Butcher. I'm going to give the rest of that to you. The patient did not survive. So whenever we have a shot like this, um, you, all, you always have to be cautious of all the hemorrhaging and things like that. So typically with this, you know, you can, you, it depends. You, you just have to try to follow that. It, it's going to kind of resemble bloody snot but you don't have to throw all the muscle away a lot of times it just finds its way through the connective tissues along or between the muscle so with a little bit of extra work you can you can typically you can work through it and obviously bow kills are 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 much easier than uh rifle or shotgun because typically you have one shot and it's a little bit easier to kind of clean up the wound and salvage your good stuff Right here, located in the front of the shoulder, you can see the shank here. That's what it looked like before I cut it apart, is, a, is another gland. You can see this gland right here. What are you We've, thinking about flat irons? Mm -hmm. We can save them. See what they look like. Mention this in other videos, but make sure you get that gland removed. Nobody wants to eat that. So you also have to remember that we don't have our bandsaw set up out here. So we wanted to make this, you know, as realistic as we could for the home user. So we purposely are not using a bandsaw. And the only cut that I've made so far is with that handsaw. Some of these cuts, boys, is gonna have just a little bit of some hemorrhaging and a little bit of blood. So make sure you get the bruising portion out of it, okay? okay. There's the mock tender on a deer.
make some nice stew meat or something like that. This is the flat iron. Couple flat irons, couple mock tenders. Just take your time when you have a shoulder hit like that. Um, you know, and just work those bruising pieces, bruise pieces out of there. Gonna find out why Sean is always wearing a plaid shirt when that's Sean and the tractor pulling the gravity wagons. He's a farmer first and a butcher second. So he's the one that, that, that explains why he's always wearing the plaid shirt when we're on the, even in the commercial operation on the processing floor, which is, it's um, probably goes without saying, but I'm gonna point it out anyway, because we get a, um, a few comments on this. Um, Want to make it clear that this venison, this white-tailed deer was harvested, uh, you know, obviously it's a natural resource here in Ohio. Young man goes, he gets his uh, hunter safety, gets a, a license, buys a tag, harvests the deer. Absolutely no part of this will ever enter um, commercial uh, for sale. It's all completely family use, completely not for sale. Um, hence the environment that we're in, hence the dog running around, the no beer nets, et cetera, et cetera. This is all done legally. Um, and then for the uh, use by the per Perkins family. So whenever you're doing anything like that, that's, that's deemed not for sale, you, don't, you aren't required to, you, know, you can basically do whatever you want. So all family use, just pointing that out. Venison flat irons. Let's get the silver skin removed off of these and we'll get them trimmed up. I think we'll add these to our lunch menu today on the Traeger. They do have a seam in the middle. So you gotta, there again, like filleting a fish, there's one. Flip it over and do the same thing on this side. There's two. A couple of venison flat irons. Let's do the same thing with this one. Remove that outside silver skin. Top that purdy. Just take your time, no rush. When, um, we've said this before, but in our videos, we're certainly not going for speed. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. We could turn it up and go for speed, but we'd rather... I think 54. 54 yeah. is, the, is, the, is the number of deer that we've processed in one day. Now, obviously, that's with uh, about a seven-person crew, but in our commercial days when we were doing all the the processing, <clears throat> we did 54 deer carcass to, uh, you know, cut out, process 54 in one, one day. I think it was a pretty long day, but we did it. Charlie, Charlie, oh, Charlie doesn't know which, which way to turn. He's got <laughs> so many choices. Just goes to show you that nothing's going to go to waste on this deer. All right, it's time to pull those beloved loins. So let's just get started. I'm going to show you how to pull it's those. That's it. Beloved. 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 Beloved's the, the word. word. So, so what I'm going <laughs> to set it three times to get you get you rolling if you're following along. So right up here on the top of this back, I'm just going to score through this meat all the way down here. And what that's going to do, that's going to allow me to start cutting these back straps out. You can do this hanging in the air too, but you want to take your knife and you want to find those rib bones and you want to cut 
down just like this. Peeling this loin out. Some people don't like when you call them back straps. I know we've called them back straps, we've called them loins, we've called them chops. Whatever you want to call it, this is how you pull it. So just following that all the way down to the back, you'll hit that vertebrae. Once you do that, you can see that vertebrae is going to run right here. So I'm going to take my knife, I'm going to start it right along. And you have to be on the correct side. So I don't want to be on this side yet. I want to be on the top side. And I want to move my knife all the way down along this back. Clear down here to the neck. Now, that loin is going to pretty much just pull right out of there. That's about where it ends, right there at the neck. No reason to go any further than that. So there's one. We'll get that set to the side. Now we're going to flip it over and we'll start the same thing on this side. So just start right here, scoring down through that fat. Now what I can do is take my knife, making sure I don't cut into that meat. Right here is the bone. Take the tip of your knife. Find the rib bones right here. Use a little bit of downward pressure. Just like this. Cutting all the way down. See how I'm, I'm using my, my knife like this, but I'm also using my wrist to make those movements needed to navigate around those bones. So once I get that done, then what I want to do is I want to start on the, this side of the vertebrae now. Just cut down through here like this. Once you get that started to come out, it'll basically just fall out of there. There's the second one. So we'll set those to the side. Now the rest of this deer, you can, however you want to do this, there's a little bit of fat we're going to get rid of. You can cut these ribs off. You can save the ribs. You can take the neck. Maybe you want to grab your hand saw, cut this neck off of here. Maybe you want to make a couple, couple venison neck roasts. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to turn that into ground meat. So Scott's going to continue to work on that. And then as far as the rest of this goes, we're not going to save um, any ribs for smoking or anything like that today, because remember, we are trying to get as much ground meat as possible. So the ribs, we're simply just going to quite frankly trim out. I've not been ever super impressed by deer ribs. Have yeah. you, Seth? No. Just I, I know that's, somebody that's... out there's got some incredible way of cooking them, uh, but personally, um, the ground meats go so much further and are consumed so much more frequently than ribs. That's where a lot of that, you know, more fats located anyway. So. And that we all know that venison fat's not that desirable to eat. So there's the meat off those ribs. So what we're going to be left with is pretty much just the rib cage and the vertebrae attached and a little bit of that front shoulder that we can continue to get all the meat off of. There's where that shot went through.
Boys need something to do? You want some of this? You can work through. Sometimes it's easier, especially when you have youngsters helping you to cut, cut things up into strips like this, and then they can work on the individual pieces. It's a little less intimidating for them. I'm gonna give them the ones that don't have the bruising, because I'll leave that for Scott. Yeah, um, I'll just go over a little bit of the, the, the deboning. Um, we get questions regarding what's okay in terms of like connective tissues, et cetera, et cetera, what's okay, what's not okay, silver skin, whatever. I'll, I'll begin with what's not okay. Obviously like bone for certain, like here's a little piece of bone that I um, found. Even when you're boning very close to the, to the bone, so in other words, your knife might nick a piece of bone, it, it sometimes can shave it off. And then um, next would be like these, these yellow cords, um, really only found in the neck, but you simply will, will not enjoy or appreciate um, that in, in the ground, whatever it is. So you're gonna need to remove the yellow cord something like that give that to your dog and then as far as this neck is concerned i kind of already went over the outside of it but whenever we talk about the neck or the shanks we um let me just find a piece of the shank in here okay right here so if you look right there um virtually impossible i know some people will do it but to to go through here and get all that out if it's translucent like that and you can you can see through it um don't be concerned about it that made with meat grinder is going to turn that into some beautiful um, minced ground meat. So don't worry about it. On the end of these uh, shanks, which we've already done, we, where it gets real thick, we will cut that off. But other than that, yeah, if it's um, more or less translucent, uh, you know, see-through skin, don't worry about it. Go into your ground meat. The thick cordage, the yellow cord, or right at the end of the shank where the ligaments actually will attach to the bone. You'll want to get those out, but otherwise, don't get too worked up about your, your ground meats and spend the whole live long day taking every single piece of silver skin out of the ground meats. So where we're at right now, I'm just working at trimming up this rest of this rib cage here and getting the much meat off of this as we can. But um, we're probably what, Scott? Half hour? 45 minutes into this. Something like that. So with some practice, this certainly doesn't have to be a daunting task. It can, it can be a lot of fun, especially when you get your family and friends involved. So to bone this portion out, I'm gonna show you something that's gonna make it a little bit easier for you. There's some soft cartilage right here that you can take your knife. I've got the eight inch Victorinox and you can cut through this, removing that those bones and let's go all the way through and then we'll go on this side just like that and it's going to take that bigger knife to do so remove that brisket bone and those bones located along that plate now what that's going to do is that's going to open these bones up at the end and I can take my knife and go down in between each bone. So without taking that, those bones off the end, it just makes it a lot more difficult. So just go down here. This is, this is how you get the most meat off this carcass possible so nothing goes to waste. Um, let me point out to you real quick, when you have Obviously, um, you know, harvested this animal, you're gonna have, we talked a little bit about this trauma, but I wanted to show you, rather than just chunk this whole piece into your scrap bin, um, a lot of times this, this hemorrhaging finds its way through, between the muscle, I, I guess, seams. So what you can do is you can get it where it's, it's sort of exposed like so, and you can take your knife and you can work at just taking the, basically as deep as the blood is, a lot of times it, it, it doesn't go through the muscles everywhere, it just goes between them. But you can kind of peel that out and then 
take the the fat off and you're left with you know it's not much but you're left with you know a nice piece of of meat between the fat and this bloody mess so i guess what i'm pointing out is whenever you see something that's looks pretty traumatic it's a little bit of see right there a little bit of careful peel back with a nice sharp knife you can salvage maybe more than you think that's the point so you guys see where the trade-off comes between spending too much time on something versus cleaning it up nicely where you can you can salvage so you guys see how much damage that one shot did with a bow and that rage broadhead Imagine if you shot it with a shotgun five or six times, sometimes more, and then take it to your local processor and complain about why you didn't get any meat back. Imagine seeing that five to six times worse, plus with a shotgun slug. So keep that in mind. Don't go run to your processor, which this whole video is designed in our channel is so that you folks can learn how to do this at home. Um, and of course the meat equipment yes absolutely well, shortly we're going to get into that and show you the grinding step i already know just based on the equipment that we have it's going to go very smooth and i'm looking i'm actually looking forward to that portion of it this this part of the process is more of you know the the hard harder physical labor a little bit daunting can be a little stressful figuring out where all the muscle seams are and etc but when you bust out that meat equipment and you start getting into your grinding and you know making some sausage and we've got the grill fired up outside that's when things get fun not to mention that what's the word which what, what forgot we, today's catchphrase what, what, what are we going with we said so many. I beloved. Can't beloved. That beloved bearded butcher blend seasoning. Ooh, I like we, it. I've added, added another B. We added a B. Beloved bearded butcher blend. Well, I've pretty well got this wrapped up, guys. What do you think? I think so. So, if I was walking through the backcountry and I saw this and I knew somebody butchered it, quartered it out, I'd say, man, those guys did a pretty good job. Think Charlie will be able to eat that? <laughs> Charlie has it's time to get started on the loins. Of course, we've pulled out two. So we're just going to go ahead and get started on the first one. Use the tip of your knife. You may have seen this in some of our other videos. Once you get that started, you can do a lot of it by hand. Like a lot of the things on this animals when you're processing. So you see. I'm just gonna pull that out of there like that. So there's one. Now let's prep the other one. And then we will get that silver skin removed. So the way that you remove this silver skin off the back, go ahead and remove this side muscle. Get all of this off of there. Clear down to the end, just like that. And then what you wanna do is you wanna start by removing the top of that gristle, just like that. Now, take your knife, give yourself a little handle, lay it down like you're going to be filleting a fish. There it is. Got almost all of it in one swipe. No hack marks. Smooth as a baby's bottom. So here we'll... Beloved baby's bottom. <laughs> Just 
finish removing this little portion down here. Just a little bit right here. There's one. Logan, how do you want your chops cut? Do you want them butterfly? Do you want them just cut into, into individual steaks? What are you thinking? Uh, what would be best? Probably individual steaks. That way you can share them with all your cousins and they can each take a couple packs home. So talking about, you know, poor man's cut on venison, who doesn't love a good steak? So we certainly wouldn't grind the chops. Feel like that'd be a, a crime, that'd be a sin. Some people, um, they don't like steak. They don't like the taste of, you know, just eating a, a deer chop. So they, maybe they would grind these into hamburger. If that's what you wanna do, you know, knock yourself out. Uh, but today, you've seen it in our other videos, a couple different ways we could do it. We could butterfly these. We could um, you know, leave them as roasts, butterfly them open, fill them with things, roll them and tie them, whatever. But um, today, per Logan's request, we're going to cut them about an inch thick into some real nice usable size portions of uh, venison chops. So tender. Hey, Logan, yeah. come here once. Oh, this is the part where you eat a raw deer chop, oh. Logan. Ready for your rite of passage into manhood? So, what I want you to do, Logan, see those? I want you to use my knife and I'm going to teach you how to cut them. So you come over here, grab my knife. Okay. Now what you want to do is you want to, you want to go like this and you want to sturdy them up with your fingers. See how I'm using my thumb right here, my forefinger, and then just cut down through there like that and then stack them over here. Okay. okay. Um, however thick you want them. It's your deer fella. You can, you can cut them however you'd like. There you go. See if you can make one swipe down through there. There you go. I think I found my replacement. <laughs> Good job, Logan. It's time for a little overview of what we've accomplished so far. Let's start with the cuts. So we saved most of our, our hind quarter cuts, sirloins, those round tip roasts, those are by far our favorite roasts. We have the two tri-tips, top round, bottom round, eye of round. Those are going to be cut into jerky, which we can do that here in a little bit. Those inner loins, venison flat irons, and then we have all of those beautiful venison chops, some stew meat, and then we have our grinding. So thinking about this from that, you know, kind of that poor man's approach, we're going to try to stretch this as far as we possibly can. We, our goal was to produce as many grindings as possible. We're gonna be in the ballpark of close to 40 pounds of trimming so far to make into ground meat, um, hamburgers, some bratwurst, things like that. And we've, uh, we've yet to add our pork fat to it. So we're gonna add about 10% pork fat. That's gonna increase our volume there. Overall on the table, we're looking at close to 70 pounds of meat so far. So remember this deer carcass weighed 129 it now produced all boneless, nearly 70 pounds of meat. So that's something to keep in mind. That's what you should be able to achieve off of a deer that size. So from this point, Scott's gonna cook some lunch. We're gonna throw some of these items on the grill and then we're going to set up the meat grinder and we're gonna set up the meat stuffer. We're gonna show you how to make some, uh, some brats. We're gonna grind some burgers. Stay tuned. Yeah, so we could, we have, we couldn't go any further without the next two pieces of the uh, components to this, which are going to be our beer or butcher blend seasoning, 
And then of course the meat equipment, because we're going to be using the grinder, the stuffer, and then the vacuum sealer. Um, should be noted, we've got the six pack, original black Chipotle, Cajun Hollywood hot. You know, right now, I, I guess I'll give the kids the choice what seasoning, probably going to choose black. Yo, black? Yeah. On um, the stuff that we're going to throw on for lunch. This is really where the fun begins. Um, things that right away come to my head, chili season, Cajun or hot are definitely going to go into the chili. The roast, we love to use the Chipotle. Original, of course, goes on everything. Hollywood, perfect for, um, you know, your chops, your stew meat, that sort of thing. But anyway, at the moment, I'm going to grab the black out of my six pack and I'm going to head to the Traeger and we're going to throw some cuts on. That way, as we work through the rest of the afternoon right here, we can enjoy some of our fruits of our labor as we move along. Logan, are you, I've got tri-tip, tri-tip, flat iron. Do you want to throw a couple chops on here too? Yeah. Do you want to just grab, want me to grab some of these? Yeah. Um, black seasoning okay? What do you have in mind? Black. Black? Okay. Are you cool with maybe this kind of tray? All right. Let's, let's cook it up. Let's get to cooking. A little uh, windy out here. I've got to count for the wind. Oh, the smell. So the kids have a Traeger Pro 22 that they that we kind of keep in the garage. I say the kids, but we kind of all use it. And that's what I've got fired up here. I got about an hour to lunch, so I'm going to just season these puppies up. Try to keep my seasoning from blowing around the corner and onto the buffalo. They don't need season yet. They still got their hides on them. <laughs> That's a dad joke. <laughs> I feel bad for my <laughs> I feel bad. My kids, they, they, they laugh so hard when they get those dad jokes. They, they can't help themselves. So we're just going to put these beloved flat irons, tri-tips, and chops on. Let them smoke at, you know, 180, 200 for a little while. Build that beautiful flavor. And then we'll finish them off at a little bit higher temp. Oh, yeah. All the feels. All right, let's get back to work while those smoke. So while our lunch is cooking, I want to cut some uh, strips for jerky. Top round. Don't forget, grains are going this way. You want to cut it against the grain. Just like this. And we're just going to cut these into strips. Trying to keep them nice and thin. So what we like to do with our jerky is use one bottle of our Beer to Butcher Blend seasoning per 12 pounds of meat. So you could season this up and you could put it in the dehydrator from meat equipment and that's how you could dry this down into your strips for jerky. We are going to save a how-to jerky video for another day using the meat dehydrator, but I wanted to show you how we would cut this into strips. You can also use ground meat with the jerky gun from meat, and then you can uh, cook that in the dehydrator as well. So like I said, we're going to save that for another day. So just continuing to cut this into these nice strips. So there's one top round. This is why it's important to have a sharp knife. You're not going to be able to achieve the same consistency with a dull blade. It's just all there is to it. So if you have kids and you make some jerky, our mother used to make ours in the oven where she would actually hang 
each strip from an oven rack and she would set the oven at about 165 degrees and she would prop the door open overnight and she'd let that jerky dry out in the oven. And I can remember being a kid, jerky was something that um, was a real treat for us. And we always looked forward to it because we'd wake up in the morning and we could smell the jerky in the oven and we knew um, we were in for a, a nice treat. It's not something we, we had often. So you could do that with this. You know, you could take each strip, poke a toothpick through it and just hang it in your oven and dry it down that way. So here again, with this bottom round, cutting those strips against the grain, you can see how the grains are running. It's gonna make a lot better bite for you. While Seth's been cutting the jerky, we talked about this in our hot dog video and our summer sausage video. I've been uh, pre-weighing five pound bags and what I'm gonna do is, these are gonna go into the freezer on whatever we're not gonna process today. In other words, today we're gonna be making a batch of bratwurst and we're gonna be making just some, some ground meat. And down the road, we've talked about this before, two reasons why we can do this, you use this method, the, the method of pre-weighing some bags and put them in the freezer. Um, reason number one, convenience of time today and rather than you know work through which we certainly could work through all this today um it's just very very uh efficient for us to go ahead and put these in five pound bags pop them in the freezer after they're vacuum sealed and then we have pre-measured bags that are frozen they're perfect they're ready to pull back out because we might find out that you know um if we process everything, you know, on processing day, if we made X amount of bratwurst, X amount of ground, uh, X amount of Smokies, we may unevenly consume those. In other words, we might eat all the Smokies right away and we're like, dang, I wish I had more Smokies. Well, when you only do, you know, a certain portion on processing day, you can pull out a chunk further down the road and um, do it then. So very nice, way to do things is just to pre-weigh five pound bags and get it set in the side go on with your day so that's what i'm doing right now pre-weighing these five pound bags i'll vacuum seal them up here in a moment they're going to be beautiful they're going to be perfect for the freezer i'm chunking up some pork fat um, pork fat's easy enough to come by in the sense where you can you can ask most butchers hey can i buy some pork fat from you this is just back fat, back fat grinds better than actual leaf lard. And um, it, alternatively, if you don't have a butcher, you don't wanna to go to the butcher, you just go in and, and get the fattiest cut of pork that you can find. Typically that's gonna be like a, a butt roast, a boneless butt roast or something like that. And use that. Um, but yeah, this, this or if you, if you butcher your pigs, save the fat. I'm just chunking this up so we can put it in with our grindings. Well, Scott's doing that, I'm working on getting some of these items into vacuum seal bags. And then um, we'll get them sealed up with the meat vacuum sealer so that they can go into the freezer for later use. So with these chops, what I'm going to do is I'll probably just layer, maybe we'll do like eight per pack so if you think about a large family with the size of these that'd probably be about the right amount just pack them according to the size of your family if you think you're going to use less pack less if you think you're going to use more do that and then these bags are real nice because you can write what's in it you can mark whether it's beef pork elk deer sausage um, then you can also put the date right on there. So it's a very handy bag. You talk about, you know, a way to preserve your product. You, you really wouldn't want to go through all this work just to find out a year later that 
you know, all of your items were freeze in the bottom of the freezer and they were freezer burnt. So just take the extra step, you know, make that investment with a vacuum chamber sealer or the uh, just a regular vac sealer from meat because in the long run, it's gonna save you money because you're not gonna be throwing stuff away. We've pulled out the trimmings that we're gonna grind up today, but these are the, the, the trimmings, which is really great because I have exactly 20 pounds in these five pound bags. And I'm just gonna put them in my chamber vac. Obviously you wanna make sure that your, your vacuum bag is smooth across the board. So that, and, and there's like a little piece of meat right here. You never want something like that right where your seal bar is. Um, these are all things that we've learned from the commercial operation. Or otherwise, what will happen is it will, it won't seal. So put that in there. That's my favorite part. Look at the beauty. Five pounds all sealed up and ready for whatever we choose to be the next step. Wash, rinse, repeat is the name of this process. It's just feel, uh, sealing up my last package, which it's too easy, but anyway, the vacuum sealing, we talk a lot about going into the freezer, but one tip trick, Scott's hot tip, that you can use, you can use the vacuum sealer to um, sort of marinate or otherwise pre-season your, your products. So something like this, you could take and you can actually shake seasoning into the bag, work that down that side. I'm using the black because I have it out. Work it down this side. Then what'll happen is once we put this into the sealer, and again, you want to be cautious that you don't get seasoning now that we put spice in there. Um, and you can do liquid too. You just have to obviously be careful it doesn't get um, run out over the seal bar. But anything you put in there, keep your seal, where, where your bag actually goes over your seal bar, keep it nice and clean. But this will actually further marinate. So like if I'm going to cook these chops like, or if I'm going to put it in the freezer, it doesn't really matter. But if I'm going to cook these chops, uh, you know, in the next few hours or next day, um, I did this with a brisket just because I had the chamber vac and put the black seasoning on it, marinated overnight, just helps pull that seasoning in there even further. So that's one more thing that you can do with a vacuum sealer is you can use it as a marinator as well. Pull these out and take a look. Now what'll happen, there's a little bit of dry seasoning there, but that'll actually, that moisture will pull in there and you'll have these beautiful pre-seasoned chops. So. Just another way that we can use the vacuum sealer. <laughs> Food's done. Ah, look at that. Who's hungry? Cause I know I am. All right. Look at that. Woo. Don't you be eating none without me. I'm going to. Oh. All right. Mm. Wow. Just to let them rest, Seth. I am. I'm not letting anything rest. Do I look like a let it rest kind of guy? <laughs> Dig in, boys. Oh my goodness. Oh. Mm. After standing here smelling that, look, Charlie's so full he, he can't even. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is tremendous. That's the flat iron. I had a chop. How about by your chop? Yeah. Oh, you don't even feel your teeth go through that. Oh, man. Unbelievable. All right, we'll eat lunch and then we'll do some grinding. How's that sound? All right, I've got my meat grinder. This is really where the fun begins. Um, in this case, I'm using the number eight, the half horse grinder. I'm going to be doing, since this is the ground meat, I'm going to be doing two grinds. First grind through the 10 millimeter plate, second grind through the 4.5 millimeter plate. That's just going to give us a really nice soft bite when it comes to 
the, the burger. So what I did was I pre-weighed um, and kept back some of our trim. And this is kind of just the balance of the trim. This is a total of um, about nine, eight to nine pounds. So once again, don't like to start the grinders dry. I'm gonna go ahead and drop that into my grinder and flip her on and here we go. Sus rummaging around behind me because we forgot to get the plunger out of the box, which I may not need it. Thank you, sir. With the smaller grinders and two with you know the pieces, we, we like to encourage about golf ball size. But with the smaller grinders, that's typically where you might need the 32. I, I barely ever touch the plunger, but in this case, you may need it just to help you get the stuff pushed through there because it's bigger chunks. So who wouldn't love a dry aged venison burger? We've added about 10 to 15% pork fat just to keep it nice and juicy. What we're gonna do is we're gonna package this in one pound packages, vacuum seal them. And we will want some chili, we will want some dry aged burger. We just grab them out of the freezer. You could pre-season these. Frankly, they're going to be so amazing that a little dash of beer to butcher blend seasoning when you throw them on the smoker or the grill is going to be all it takes. But you could go ahead and put seasoning in them right now, which we're going to do with our bratwurst, of course. There you have it, grind one complete. So I'm just going to dump that in there while I switch out. Get my 4.5 milliliter, millimeter. I used a little bit of fat to push that through there at the end. Then I can just toss that. All right, I'm just gonna blend this up a little bit by hand so that my fat to lean ratio, man, look how delicious looking that is get a little pile going up here get a little push down in there so think about this for a minute a 349.99 cent investment so 349 dollars 99 cents you can buy this number eight grinder from meat and produce products to feed your family for many, many years to come. People think that, you know, that's a lot of money, which it's an investment. You gotta think of it that way. If you dropped your deer off at a processor, depending on what you had made, you may spend that in just one trip. So keep that in mind. There's that venison tri-tip hot off the grill. Do you trust me? It's brotherly love. Mm. Oh, Isn't that good? Oh my goodness. I need you to stand right beside me and keep that up, okay? <laughs> so since the grill's still hot, I'm gonna go ahead and make... Well, the grill's hot and we, we ran out of steak. I see no reason why we shouldn't just go ahead and grill up a couple burgers. That pork fat's blended in there real nice. Logan, can you grab the black seasoning? 
Let's go to the grill. Sprinkle a little on those. And I'll flip them over, we'll do this side too, okay? We'll test Uncle Scott and see how he did with his blend, okay? Check out the power of that Rage broadhead. It's lodged right into that bone. Logan wants to save this and boil it for a souvenir. All right, all right, all right. There you have some beautiful packs of ground venison. Really doesn't look any different than ground beef. I put now, your. This uh, is a job that in the shop that I right here. I I should basically I should take the camera from Spencer and I should have him do this instead of myself because I've done way too many of these things. Spencer is like a pro at packing burger. He would have this slipped into this bag. He's I got have five done already. <laughs> you got to hurry up. I will get it. I will get it. Just bear with me. Sometimes I have to just step back and let the professionals do it. Go in the bag. It's your home. Go in your home. <laughs> Seriously, I think I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to just trade places with you, Spencer. Okay, Scott. What button do I press? No buttons need to be pressed. You notice how I grabbed a pack of, I grabbed a pack of, uh, uh, or a bite of steak there. Look, Seth's even, it's I'm setting it. him up for the win. He's got it ready for me already. I don't like being on this side of the camera. This is no. Weird. This is way weird. <laughs> Look, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I know Seth's got you shaped yeah. up, but it, I don't think it would have mattered. I kind of think that I'll stick with this job until the burger's done, then I'll be happy to trade it back. I don't know, Scott, but I'm pretty sure you got fired from packing burger. I'm happy to give that job up. <laughs> when do I get to give it up? When Seth's formed that last package. Perfect. All right. All right. All right, there, there it is. is. <laughs> nice job, Spencer. Thank you. So we're getting ready to grind our bratwurst. Um, I've got these bags weighed out. We've got 10 pounds of the trimmings. And I've got two pounds of pork fat for a total of 12 pounds. Now, the really great thing is you have two choices here with regard to your beer to butcher blend seasoning. You can do one six ounce shaker to do your 12 pounds of meat. So take a shaker out of a box, dump it in the 12 pounds of meat. Or if you buy the bucket, it's simply one scoop, which is a tablespoon per pound of meat. So this is gonna get a total of 12. And bam, number 12. So that's the great thing about the bucket. It's got the scoop in there. And then we just blend this up by hand. And as you mix it, it'll pick up all this spice sort of around in the corners, coating everything evenly. And then we're gonna do one grind through the four and a half millimeter plate. We like one grind on our bratwurst through that plate. Gives it a nice de definition. So we Simply get everything well coated. We chose the original bratwurst, or excuse me, to make original bratwurst by using the original beer to butcher blend seasoning. Simply one of our favorites. You can of course use any one of the spices with that ratio. So now that we've got it all spiced and seasoned up, time to get to grinding. Okay, 
quick and easy. We've got our brought batch. And now... Can I do the honors? Please. We add the high temp cheese for the, the full effect. This is high temp cheddar. Pretty easy to find online. We're, we like to add it at a ratio of 10%. Makes for one of our favorite products is our original beer to butcher blend seasoning mixed with the high temp cheese mixed with our venison made into a brat. So we just fold that all in here, get everything evenly spread out. Now, should point this out. If at any point you feel like you need to, you can add some, some cold water to the, the mixture. If it feels like it's too tight to, to stuff through the stuffer, um, just get a little bit of cold water, mix it in there. It'll kind of add enough moisture that you can get it through your stuffer. A lot of times we try it without adding any water just to see, but now that we have a nice ball formed, uh-oh, he's got more food for me. It's time for you to try a deer burger. This is one of the burgers that I just made. I'm not feeding you anymore. You can get it yourself. I'm just going to go for the big guy go right here. What, what does this have? Black seasoning? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, you, you pulled the switch real. <laughs> try this, boys. That's like a gourmet. It's like a steakhouse burger. It's like a steak burger. Here you go, Spencer. Oh my goodness. I'll, I'll feed you. No, you, no, okay. <laughs> wow. Holy moly. Isn't that good flavor? That might be one of the most impressive. That is incredible. Yeah. Wow. That's just warm. burger with black seasoning. Imagine that loaded up with Pickles gooey, and... gooey cheese and a nice bun, and you've got uh, you know onions piled on there, all that old man stuff, boys. So... I mean, here Put again, the barbecue sauce on we're there. talking about stretching a deer as far as you possibly can to feed a big family um, for the cheapest price. This is you beyond economy. This is yeah, like this gourmet. Is, this is gourmet. That's what I was going to, I was going to mention, you know, this is ground venison and producing an absolute gourmet product. So on a budget, but yet still amazing. Mm. So we decided that this did need a little bit of water even before we stuffed it. So it doesn't take much, just enough to add a little bit of, I guess for the lack of a better way of saying it, lubrication. So that way when you go to put it through that, just a tiny bit more there, bud. You can even put little finger holes in it just to get that water in the mixture. That's where you want it? I like it. Okay. The smell. I'm just gonna make a big meatloaf here. See if I can pull this off. Nice. Look at that. We're using a natural casing on these. These are available um, on Amazon. There again, we'll throw in a link. You can grab some natural casings. You do wanna soak your casings 30 to 40 minutes prior to using them. So this is a natural um, hog intestine. These are gonna end up being about a 32 millimeter by the time we're done. Um, they do have salt in them, so they, they stay preserved very well. So if you want a natural casing brought, go ahead and snag some hog casings. So now that that's completed, let's go ahead and just get our stuffer set up. Now I am going to, we talk about releasing the air with that air lock, push it down. So you can see it already coming out of the stuffer. Look at that cheese in there. I'm gonna remove my gloves. These can be a little bit difficult getting them on the stuffing horn when you wear gloves. So that's the reason why I'm going barehanded here. But what you wanna do is you wanna take your casing and dip it in the water. You wanna fill these with some water or they will be an absolute nightmare trying to get them on the horn if you don't do that. So just go ahead and get them started. You can even take your water and, and help your casing on by by running a little water up the casing like this. 
So once you get your casings all on there, I'm going to uh, see Scott's putting a little bit of water on our table because that's going to help these the sausage slide because that's uh, important as you stuff these, you want them to be able to coil. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring our sausage inside this tube to the end of the casing before I get started. That way we don't uh, fill the link up with a bunch of air. So bring it out to the end, pull your casing out. I'm going to go ahead and put a knot in the end of it. That'll keep your meat inside the casing. And then we'll just go ahead and get started filling them. So you want to fill them fairly tight, but without putting a hole in them. And you also want to be able to twist these. So we're going to link these today. So just go slow. There's no reason to, to hurry. We're not in a race here. So go ahead and just get them filled up. As soon as I get this strand done, I'll tie off the end and then we'll twist them and fill some more. So now we'll tie this end. And there you have a whole nice long strand of length. So to twist them, we just want to start here, twist one way, start here, twist back, so on and so forth. And you can make these whatever size, you know, your brat bun is or whatever. So there you have a nice little strand of venison brats. So you just keep repeating this process until your stuffer's empty and then fill it and make some more. Man, think about throwing a football party and putting some of these on the grill. Talk about a way to impress your friends. My fingers are too fat. Some people say that our friends make fun of us because our fingers look like bratwurst, <laughs> sausage fingers. When you twist these, you, you do want to take your, your forefinger and your thumb and press on them first or you'll, or you'll split them wide open. I so can you, take over, bro, and you yeah. can keep going. I'll keep going. If you'll allow me. I'll allow you. I've got a couple tight ones there for you. I don't know if, which way you went. I don't know if you went this way or that way. Just twist, I'll, twist until I, they don't untwist on you. I guess you. I'll find out. This has been too much fun. Just having the grill sitting here fired up. We're gonna smoke some of these bratwurst. Wives are gonna wonder why when we come home we won't be hungry for dinner, but maybe they'll be happy. The natural casings, they're going to give you a real nice, a real nice bite, a nice snap when you eat them. Um, that's what most people crave. I will say if you fill these, um, these are, you know, there's not a lot of air pockets in them. If you do get an air pocket, you can take a knife and poke it and release that air. They actually sell a little tool that you can go down through there. But um, if they're like this and you don't see a lot of air in them, I personally wouldn't worry about them. I would just twist and, uh, Go to town. Or you can coil. Yeah, you can coil them up Some like Some people that. just like to make a coil. Whatever. Whatever suits your fancy. These, um, using natural casings, it's, it, can be, it can be a lot of fun. Now you can butcher your own pig. You oh, talk, you talk, Lord have mercy. You talk about... He's going you talk about, full old-fashioned on us here. You talk about really saving some money. You can butcher your own pig, save the intestines, and clean them yourself. Nothing fancy on this knot. Just, just simply, you know, just put a knot in it. Keeps the product from shooting out the end. Takes a little bit of time learning how to properly fill the casings, but once you get it down pat, you'll get her. Something else that you don't want to forget, if you look over here at the stuffer, C-clamps. C-clamp them to your table. 
you won't regret it because the thing won't be jumping around on you. Crank away, son. You got it? Now here, don't ever let go of that handle when it's under pressure like that because guess what's going to happen? The thing's going to fling around and it'll whap you right in the chin. But um, here's another you know, tip. Get somebody, I know we have a 10 year old Logan on the handle there, but um, get somebody to do the cranking for you and then you can use two hands down here and that makes it a lot easier. Thanks for doing the honors, Logan. So I've been um, twisting, we cut, so you can cut it between the twists. We're gonna go ahead and get some of these in the vacuum seal pouches. And um, so you can, you can cut them twist them, cut them, put them in the vacuum seal pouches. Typically we do like four lengths per package. You can put this whole coil in a pouch if you want. Um, you can carry them right out to the grill and put them right on the grill right away. There's nothing preventing you from doing it sort of any different style that you like. So I'm getting ready to, um, to uh, seal these brats. And because I don't really want them to pull the meat out of the end of the package, I'm just going to turn my seal time down. It's adjustable and five uh, second increments. So I turned it down from 30 to 20. That's just gonna help prevent pulling the meat out of the, inner, uh, the ends of the casing. By turning the seal down a little bit, maybe just a tiny bit, but I did a nice job of keeping the product inside the casing. Here you go, bro. Got some more for you. Nice. Pretty rewarding feeling. See how nice those look? All tied up like that. You can also, if you have the time, you can put these in, a, in your vac bag and then um, freeze them just a little bit. So partially freeze them and then seal them because then that will... Uh, That'll help not squeeze out the end of your casings. <laughs> We're going to be so incredibly full from all the stuff that we've eaten today, but I'm, I'm completely good with it. Load me up. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. Cheers. Wait. Yeah. There you go. Mmm. Mm. That snap. That snap. Oh. I've experienced some of the best eating today that I've had since the last time we did. Right. This. Look at that cheese. And you know what? Showing man shot the deer. We literally just finished making these. And now we're eating them. Mm. A lot of flavor profiles. One thing on. after the next, it just keeps... A lot of levels. It just keeps going. This is like a party in my mouth. Want one? Get a bun. Probably full. Are you full? You want one? Grab a I'm bun. Full. You're not full. Eat up, boys. Grab a bun, yeah. Go for it. We took over his shop for the day. It's so my space. The least we can do it. We're, <laughs> we're, we're waiting, we're waiting we're for him to quit making noise. The one space yeah. of the farm that he had on Can't his even own. get my stuff out of here. And he, uh, he had it taken Screw over. You, guys. you want a sandwich? I'm good. Thanks. All right. Start to finish, we've processed that entire deer carcass. Um, we've either got it in a fully processed form all the way down to cook like the bratwurst, which are delicious. We've got it in some of the trim bags that can be further processed like we showed you in some of the other videos where we pull those out of the freezer. We've got jerky strips cut. We've got pre-seasoned vacuum sealed chops. But we've got this thing knocked out and we can only do that with the equipment that we have from madewithmeat.com with the spices that we used turned out some amazing product in a short period of time 
And that's really what it's about. We use the stuffer, but with just as little as a grinder, you could get the, um, because you can put the stuffer attachment on the grinder, you could get the same results. So we encourage you, madewithmeat.com, you're gonna love any piece of equipment that you get from them. You can start with just a grinder, you can expand from there, even year over year, you can add a new piece of equipment. Obviously the chamber vac sealed up all of our packages. You could of course get the tabletop version of that. Um, and it turned out great. We had a lot of fun doing that's really what it's about, getting your family involved and then putting meat on the, on the table that you know exactly what happened start to finish. You know every single step of the way so that you realize when you bite into that, that you know exactly what was in the package. Big thanks to Logan for shooting this deer. Boys practice hard. We're gonna get the rest of these boys a deer this season. We want to show you an economical way to process your venison, something you can look forward to eating every dinner for every night of the week. So here it is. We hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned for more to the Beard Butchers on YouTube. See you next time. Thanks for watching. See ya.